the scientific. Um, it was it's a, a, a company devoted to really. It started out as a dosimetry company, uh, and um, what I'll do is just show you about 12 slides, just showing you some of the things that we do, the products, and uh, some of the uh, the spinoffs that have come from those those different products. Many of these are, are products that are developed by other people, um, although we have some development of our own in process as well. Um, we really focused on external dosimetry, uh, radiation detection, and spectroscopy, um, and we're trying to fill voids. We don't want to. We don't want to be a big Marion or Thermo or, or, or large company. We're, we're looking for the voids that that really aren't serving the customer um, and try to fix those problems. Um, we started in 2012. We're an S corporation, and we've got three locations um, that I'll show you in a minute. Two are commercial and one is a development location where we're trying to do some uh, research and development. Um, the Stowe location and the San Diego location are both commercial, and the Mansfield location is a, a service slash R&D facility. It's part of a, an incubator um, uh, office space. Um, my background, I came from Thermo Fisher. I was there through all the different name changes, St. Coban, Harshaw, uh, Thermo, Thermo Fisher, and um, I, I am also a representative on IEC uh, Technical Committee 45, Subcommittee 45B, and, and focused on some of the working groups there for dosimetry and um, radiation detection protection. Um, my partner um, also uh, runs, has run storefront businesses and online retail, so we kind of complement. I draw square boxes and she does more, more creative type things, so it works out kind of good besides a, a number of the other employees that, that kind of fill in the voids that we don't have. This is just a, a picture of kind of the different facilities that we uh, work uh, from. Uh, so presently I'm out in San Diego, um, but the main office is in Stowe, Ohio, the bottom right. And we have a um, what we have a collaboration with the UPS store next to uh, us. Uh, so basically, our office is next to the UPS store, and they do all of our logistics for us. So stuff coming in, stuff going out, it takes care of all that. Um, they, they handle it for us and, and 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 do a great job. So it works out really well. The top right picture is Braintree. That's in Mansfield, Ohio, and it's a business incubator where we actually do some product development. We're working on some remote monitoring uh, technology and some add-on tools that, that kind of fill some voids that, that uh, you know, users have been complaining about. And with the COVID-19 uh, that's come about, we, we kind of have been positioned in a pretty good situation because we, we really have always worked remote. Um, you know, while we have office space, it, the way we're set up, we can work totally remote through the, the cloud or the servers that we, we've got in place. So it makes it work out quite well. Um, so this is just kind of a collage. Um, next slide, number four, is a collage of different products that we that we offer. And how we came into this is um, throughout my years, I've seen a lot of products that um, just either never escaped the laboratory, the, meaning they were they were good bench designs, but they never made it to the field. Or there were some really good, interesting field products that were maybe developed around a certain country's nuclear power or medical community, but never escaped that country. So, you know, maybe there was something developed in England that was really unique, but it never escaped um, England. Or in the case of the domino, which I'll talk about as a success story, as an instrument component, it started as a spinoff from Kansas State University, and, and they were great doing the technical aspects, but they needed help getting it out to the world, getting it commercialized. So it was a good collaboration with that uh, um, uh, opportunity. So kind of I'll, I'll talk about each one of these in the successive slides and how they all fit together. Um, and then the other part of it is we're, we're continuing to expand service, uh, mainly for, <clears throat> for these products to make sure that um, – the customers can, can continue to use them, or if they need calibration, that they, uh, they're they able to get the certificates or what's necessary to, to keep them active in the field. So to start with dosimetry, and I'll have to say that's probably where our core strength is, um, we have um, several uh, different, I'll call it products in that area. 
Um, so the first is the active extremity dosimetry uh, system. And um, what it allows you to do is real-time monitoring, mainly from an Alara standpoint, to be able to go and monitor uh, a worker's dose to their fingers before they read out their uh, finger rings, for example, or if they're not wearing any extremity dosimetry, to be able to wear the uh, whole body badge and use this to test to see if they're getting too much dose to the fingers or to the hands. And uh, it also works very well from a training perspective because you can then look to see what dose is occurring to both hands, then maybe you can reduce the dose. Let's say if their primary hand is the right hand, uh, maybe you can reduce the, the work or the dose to the left hand um, by just watching the worker and monitoring the dose, you know, via video and um, and then going back and using it for a coaching uh, example where you can tie the video time frame to the to the output of the dosimeter's time and and match what the worker was doing. Um, on, the, on the right then um, goes more to the medical and that's also from the bottom left is from a, an eye dosimetry. It's become much more of a, um, a concern or an interest in Europe when uh, ICRP 103 came out uh, recommending lowering the dose to the eye, to lens of the eye. So we've worked uh, with some products that uh, Thermo Fisher have from a dosimeter standpoint and then um, developed working with another company to develop a headband uh, type dosimeter that would fit over the eye. And then you can see a phantom that was developed by Oramed to test these different eye dosimeters. That's on the top right uh, with one of the eye dosimeters wrapped around the head phantom. Um, we're actually now working with Public Health England to uh, take the active extremity dosimeter, which monitors just HP07, uh, 0.07, and uh, make it viable for uh, HP3. Uh, so we're, we're seeing a lot more concern about eye dosimetry that we're, we're trying to focus on. Um, on the bottom left is a, an extremity dosimeter. It tends to be more of interest in Canada, Europe, where they're, they're trying to monitor dose to the tip of the finger, where maybe there's a high dose gradient uh, between the tip of the finger, base of the finger, where the ring might be or the wrist if you're, they're just using a wrist or a whole body type uh, dosimeter. And then lastly, very limited um, applications, but a criticality dosimeter. You may be familiar with it from activation metals or activation materials. So from a very high dose standpoint uh, or prompt neutron or prompt gamma, the metals or the materials, the, the yellow you can see in kind of the center of the picture is a, a sulfur tablet um, where those materials become activated. And then you can read it out from a triage or from a a reconstruction standpoint, uh, post hence uh, through either just uh, Geiger Mueller's or uh, spectroscopy. So it kind of uh, gives us kind of a, a swath of different dosimetry uh, offerings. And then the second uh, page on the same theme of dosimetry, uh, page six, um, we, we work both with TL, that's uh, uh, you know something I work quite closely with during my time at Thermo Fisher, um, and also because you know TL is not the only method, OSL, uh, different different technologies, readout systems for both TL and OSL. And then we offer a training program. It's been typically once every year, but now with things going on, we've kind of backed off. Uh, but we offer it in the U.S. and also in England, um, a, a four-day training program on external dosimetry based around the, uh, the Harshaw Thermo uh, products. Page seven then kind of takes us away from uh, uh, personal dosimetry more into radiation detection and these are um, plug-on adapters for such as a 14-pin uh, PMT uh, photomultiplier slash sodium iodide or other type detector BGO that allows you to either do single channel analysis or multi-channel analysis um, with different types of outputs so you can either use the existing programs that are a part of it or uh, write your own programs and connect to it with either a USB or an, an Ethernet connection and then develop some you know new products of your own and, and these have been used also for um, wide-scale applications everything from uh, university laboratories to actually mining applications where they're looking for um, uh, potassium 40 for example and they're using it to help them figure out where to mine the, 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 um, the sweet spot of where the minerals are on the bottom are kind of bookends, if you will, both on the left then is for legacy type detectors. So if you have a, a legacy detector that's on a coaxial cable and you want to connect it to a spectrum uh, analyzer, this is a way to do it and you can get the data out through a USB or through an Ethernet or even through a TTL output. 
Um, and then on the right is for more advanced type detectors, like with SIPMs, the silicon um, photomultiplier tubes, or such as even some of the um, strontium iodide and many of the new types of materials that have been coming out. And they're quite small. Um, you can probably tell the right one comes from Europe because it's showing a euro uh, coin next to the size of the, uh, the readout box or the, the spectrum analyzer box. Um, the next slide on page eight um, moves more into the laboratory, and, and we got involved with this because initially alanine dosimetry, um, mainly for high-dose applications, has becoming more and more applicable to lower and lower dose applications. And now, at this point, people are talking about measuring two gray uh, with alanine dosimetry, where typically you might be at 10 kilogray or 100 kilogray using it for um, uh, sterilization processes or, or um, using it for uh, uh, food processing to sterilize uh, food or sterilize medical applications. Um, then, is there a question? No, I, if we could have everybody mute, or I can mute them. Stand by. Okay. Stand by. Okay. Okay. Joe, I'm going to mute all, and then you'll have to unmute yourself. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. So thank thank you. Um, so we've we've kind of moved now toward working with the uh, electron spin resonance or elect electron paramagnetic resonance systems because they um, allow us to now do dosimetry at much lower doses. And there's applications both in the medical uh, arena as well as um, homeland security and uh, um, in the chemical biological research areas. Um, to the right of that is a combined instrument that's being used in different applications uh, of thermoluminescence and OSL combined into one system. It's not meant for personal dosimetry, but much for research type applications. And we've seen applications where um, people are using it to actually test um, the afterglow, for example, from different types of scintillation or um, solid state type materials, all the way over to testing um, uh, or doing dating of um, archaeological samples, uh, so it kind of has a range there. I'll come down to the bottom right because on the left is a little bit different, but the uh, on the bottom right is a, a, a what's called PSL, photostimulated luminescence uh, food testing system. So in this case, uh, you may be worried about spices or materials that were uh, procured for your, your beer or your food products or if you're making vitamins or such, that they've not been irradiated because if you want to sell them into certain countries, you have to prove to those regulatory agencies that they've not been irradiated and uh, that uh, you've tested it and shown certification and such. So with the PSL food, um, it's using a, a light stimulus uh, and then the material glows and um, you're able to determine how much dose, if there was any, uh, in that food material. And it's interesting because what happens inside of food, you think, well, how does food work uh, from a, a PSL or, or a, a measurement standpoint? But there's actually either TL or OSL characteristics in a lot of different materials. And a lot of times in uh, spices, for example, you can see that that retention of, of radiation dose uh, uh, in the materials through either a TL measurement or through an OSL measurement. And PSL is just kind of an offshoot from OSL. On the uh, left-hand side, then, um, is a precision pump, and that kind of is a really outlier for us. But it fits into the um, a, a laboratory standpoint because in, in some cases in the lab, from, from a dosimetry or from other applications, they're trying to measure precise amounts of uh, liquid movement. And when we get to, the, I think it's the next slide, and, and look at the field applications when they're they're looking for energy and and measuring radiation uh, on core a uh, core sample that's been pulled out of the ground they may be looking and seeing the porosity of those uh, different cores and they can use a pump like this to measure that uh, porosity so um, slide nine then um, is now moving to the field 
And the two top instruments are uh, related to energy exploration. So core loggers, people that go out in the field and, and drill and measure the core or draw core out of the ground, uh, they're looking for certain characteristics of those core. And part of that is, is actually just norm. And so the main things that they're trying to find are potassium, uh, uranium, and thorium. And by using these two instruments, they're both sodium iodide based, um, they're able to go in and look at those norm characteristics and based on that they can then go and do measurements that compare against like what they call wireline or drilling while measuring uh, where they have a, a detector downhole and they're doing uh, measurements of the radiation coming from the core or from the hole and then they can correlate that to the measurements that they have above ground uh, either with a handheld instrument on the right where you just take it and move it from spot to spot and check the the radiation uh, and and uh, or on the left where it's actually put on top of the core barrel and moved across it at a certain rate both of them are spectrometers, but because the core logger guys are not interested so much in um, spectrum, they're just interested in the components, it gives them the component aspects, but it also gives them some other information such as percent concentration. There's a, a unit called API 200, it's American Petroleum Institute 200, and it's a certain mix of uh, potassium, thorium, and uranium together. Um, so it kind of fits in, in the, the, the field application in that sense, and that's where also the pump uh, comes into play as well. Um, on the bottom right um, is, again, kind of a, a little bit strange type of instrument. It's, um, it's, it's called the LED Micro SF and, uh, for spectrofluorimetry. And what they use this for um, is for art, art fraud or for dating of different art applications. And the way this works is it actually uses um, a light signal of a certain spectrum and then it, the, the, re, the reply spectrum or the, the emitted spectrum uh, is measured. And you can then tell what type of pigments were used in these different um, art artifacts. And you can then determine whether those pigments were truly available during that time frame when that piece of art was supposed to be um, uh, produced or, or painted or, or manufactured. And um, the reason this fits in is because really it's nothing more than an OSL uh, slash PSL type of system in a different form factor with different processing algorithms that then allow us to look at it. So again, it may seem like very far field, but it kind of fits in TL, OSL, dosimetry type applications for us. Um, so from an outsider, it may look like these don't even fit, but they really have kind of a common thread or kind of a common um, uh, lineage or heritage, if you will. Um, the thing that we, I'm, I'm going to skip uh, another product uh, that we have, but uh, just to touch on service because then the next couple slides fit together. Um, we, we do, uh, we've been continuing to, to do more services. We started out with bench type service um, from both a repair standpoint and also a calibration standpoint. But people have been coming back and asking for other types of service such as preventive maintenance, um, upgrades of different things where maybe the software or the firmware needs to be upgraded. And a lot of times now because of the, the COVID-19, we can do a lot of this remote because the systems have the capability to do remote access. Um, and we can actually do the, um, the upgrades or, or perform different types of measurements remotely. Sometimes if there's somebody there to actually change a sample or so, so you can't necessarily be there with your own hands, but if somebody's there and they don't allow other people on site, they can be your hands and you can then remote into their systems and, and do a fair amount of work um, for them remotely. Um, and that fits in kind of with on the, on the far left where it says annual IQOQ, which is um, installation quality, operational quality. A lot of uh, uh, folks that are tied into the FDA, for example, have to show that the systems perform to a certain requirement, to a certain documented requirement. And so they'll require these installation quality, operational quality type programs. And uh, again, we can do those either on site or in the case of the quarantining, we can do it remote as long as somebody's there to change samples for us. So kind of the, the lastly is, is kind of a success story. So the, the Domino a Microstructured Neutron Detector, or MSND, um, is a small little um, 
detector, if you will. It's a neutron detector, and inside of it is lithium-6. So if you can imagine folks that are familiar with old-style car radiators, if you don't have a Tesla, um, where the, the, the radiator had kind of a serpentine or kind of an S-shape pattern to it to kind of extend the area of the, um, the surface, Inside the domino, um, and, and this is about, the, do, the domino is about an inch and a quarter by an inch wide by less than a fourth of an inch thick. Um, it has lithium-6 integrated into this, um, this radiator-type microstructure, or, uh, like an S-shaped uh, microstructure. And when neutrons um, uh, hit the uh, domino, the lithium-6 uh, converts the neutron to an alpha, and then the alpha is measured on the silica below it and allows us to do um, thermal neutron measurements. So it's nothing different than a normal neutron detector where you have to moderate typically the neutrons to get them to thermal levels. But it, what it does allow us to do is try to find ways to create new types of systems without helium-3, BF, uh, you know, uh, BF-3, um, different types of, of other uh, scintillation type detectors even that are trying to measure neutrons. Um, so inside the domino, if you look to the right, the MSND tile, uh, typically inside of a domino there are four of these little tiles, and that's that's what contains these microstructured um, uh, lithium-6 uh, packing of the material. and. Um, you can you can work with either an MSND tile by itself and and solder it to a, a board just like any other sort of electronic component, or you can take a full domino and and also put it on a board. The other part of the domino is it allows you to daisy chain them together. So if you notice on the left hand picture, the uh, the pins on the left side and the and the socket on the right hand side, it allows you to put these together. About a meter long, you can go with cascading these, and they don't have to be linear. They can be in any shape or, or diameter or however you want to form them. And people have taken these types of, of, of dominoes and actually done some interesting work with them. Um, the next picture, the next slide I'll show you, is actually a, um, a picture of it for a standard neutron ball. But there are now some products coming out that are actually trying to do neutron spectroscopy where you, you take a series of these dominoes and imagine putting a series of these dominoes on a, on a, uh, a micro or a, a PC board, a printed circuit board, and then put some moderator in front of it or reflector in back of it uh, for uh, getting the albedo neutrons, um, and then or the albedo effect, and then uh, put another uh, board with another uh, uh, polyethylene plastic in front of it, and do that as a series, maybe five, six, seven, eight times, and now you've got while being very heavy, you have possibly a way to me measure fast neutrons compared to thermal neutrons. Uh, so the front, front detectors would measure the thermal neutrons, and as they pass through the various layers of polyethylene, high-density polyethylene, they would then be um, thermalized, and then you would know that the ones that made it to the back of the detector would be, or the back of the unit would be much more um, from the fast neutron perspective. Um, the, the, the good news with the domino, besides its configuration and being able to also um, uh, uh, be, use very low power, it's not very good for very large applications. So the innovative folks out of uh, Kansas State have, uh, and Radiation Detection Technology, which is actually the commercial company, have come up with also a lithium foil uh, multi-wire multi -wire proportional counter, uh, which allows us now to get to backpack and maybe potentially larger type systems for car, truck, portal type systems that might be measuring for neutrons and more of a homeland security type uh, uh, thought process. But uh, right now it would be more of a backpack type of uh, system. So with that, from a success standpoint, um, the uh, radiological detection system, it's one of the joint project office uh, initiatives where they're replacing the old multifunction function radiac, if you're familiar with that, uh, typically the Navy or uh, or such. I think it was the AN65 might have been the designator. Um, but um, it's now, instead of using a helium-3 detector inside the neutron ball, it's actually using a, a, a number of dominoes and tile to replace the helium-3. And part of that benefit is they could make uh, the electronics much more uh, remote and or independent, and also much, much lower power usage. So battery life is much, much more extended and such from a standpoint of the, the detector itself. Um, and they were able to deal with very high different or very diverse ranges of radiation um, 
uh, from the standpoint of using uh, the, the tile part of it as opposed to just the domino. Um, so that's kind of a, a success story that we, we look toward and, and, and actually are seeing several other devices. Hopefully this year, maybe next year, will come, come to, uh, to market as well using the domino. Um, so lastly, kind of to summarize and to, to make sure I don't go too long, is our, our real focus is on specialty dosimetry uh, uh, items, products, radiation detection and spectroscopy um, uh, products and systems. Um, we, we really want to serve and, and fill voids that um, mainly aren't filled, you know, by anybody else and, and, and have a diverse product offering, but not be so diverse that it's too far away from our our core knowledge or our core or um, uh, capabilities. Um, and, and the big thing is we don't want to just provide a box. We want to provide a solution. And, and that's really where our main focus is. So our motto is serving the dosimetry, radiation detection, and spectroscopy communities with innovative products and services. So come see us if you have a chance, and I'd love to answer some questions. Sure. Thank you, Joe. Let's uh, give Joe a round of applause here. I don't know if you can see us or not, Joe. Thank you. But I'll, I'll start. I'll start if you don't mind. Uh, I teach a two-hour PEP on neutron detection and applications, and I would love to work your product into that uh, PEP session if you would send sure. me information on it. That'd be great. Be glad to. Yeah. Anybody else you can use the chat feature over here to the right? Or mic up and ask away. So we have recorded this, and I will download it and ask Dave Borrego to compress it and put it on our website under the meeting archive. And then, Joe, if you could send me the – well, you already sent me the PDF file, so I'll post that there as well. Great. And, uh, thank uh, you, everybody, for your time, yeah. too. I appreciate you uh, joining, and thank you so much. Okay, wait, we've got one question here from Bot. Please tell me more about Core Logger. Sure. I don't know if, can you still see my screen? Yes. Yeah, I can see. Sure. So in the field, um, in the past, what they tried to do, you know, you, you may be familiar with wireline or multiline where they drop a detector down the uh, core shaft and they're measuring the radiation levels, um, again, the norm. Uh, and, and when they pull the core out of the ground, they want to have a way to correlate that core back to the, the wireline or multiline that's been pulled out. And in the past, a lot of these systems were very big, bulky. It took two people to work with it. And, and the, the two instruments on, on the page, uh, hopefully you're seeing, are, are very much portable. So the, the handheld instruments in the pounds range, a few pounds, it uses a, a two by two sodium iodide detector and a spectrum analyzer on the back. Um, so it does have spectrum, 1024 channels of spectrum, but in the, in the case of the, the loggers, they don't really want that. They don't understand it necessarily. And so what it does is it just provides them with six regions of interest. Three are set around the potassium-40, the thorium, and uranium. Um, and then it does other calculations to give, um, like, for example, percent concentration based on a priori knowledge of the core diameter. Um, and so uh, uh, th that's the main data that they're looking for. And then they can extract that data and look at a graph, and then they can compare that graph to what's downhole, um, or even after the fact, uh, after they do other measurements on the on the core sample, um, they can they can do these radioactive measurements using the the um, the handheld instrument. But if, if you imagine, uh, a lot of times a handheld is, is tedious. Somebody has to stand there. It takes up a worker. It's, it's slow because you maybe only want to measure every six inches, and you may have a core that's 30, 120 foot long. So then we, we work together to develop a, a rolling core, which uses a much bigger detector. It has shielding where the, the, the instrument on the right has no uh, shielding, um, and the instrument on the left has a, has a little bit of uh, shielding around the uh, four-inch detector, um, and it has wheels and an encoder that allows it, as it's moving down the core, to measure speed and, and do uh, the measurements while it's moving. 
you know, from a from a, a pure physics standpoint, it, and the core loggers are not physicists, it's not a great way because it, you're not getting a lot of statistics. Whereas when you put the instrument above, against the core and you go and stand there for 20 seconds or 30 seconds, you're getting a lot more statistics on the spectrum. On the left-hand side, you may be moving a few inches per second. So again, the statistics are going to be less, but, but they're fine with that because they're looking at that point just for trends. I don't know if that answered your question. Can you, hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My question is, my name is Ram Bhatt. I'm in the U.S. Air Force. We yes. do a lot of uh, decommissioning work. Now, I know when you take the decommissioning according to NRC, whatever you do the survey, but they ultimately they need at least a couple of soil samples taken to the lab, and it will take another two, three months and get analyzed. And then if there's some problem, then again, we have to redo the, re, redo the whole thing. So my question is, does it replace sending to the lab? What kind of sensitivity you have, how deep you can go? Uh, for example, sometimes I seen sodium magnesium alloy with an NRC license and they buried up to eight to 10 feet below the ground. So it depends upon individuals. So how, how is it, a, how, how deep it can go? Uh, what can be the diameter of your core, and what kind of sensitivity can it replace with the laboratory sending? So the the way they work, the way this works is the the uh, exploration folks actually drill a core sample out of the ground. So they're 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 drilling into the ground and pulling out, let's say, a five inch diameter core, and so now you you have inside of for example, an aluminum barrel that's just bigger than five inches with these this rock or this core sample. Uh, so that's the way the instrument works. It's not really looking at the top of the ground and trying to measure the radiation into the ground. It's actually measuring the rock that's been pulled out of the ground. That's fine. Uh, that means many a times, you see, the rules, NRC rules are... <clears throat> Our Marsim goes only up to six inches below the ground uh, surface. So, if you can go and prove that below this six up to six inches or more, you can go, then you can tell instead of sending take that four samples, send it to the lab. Yourself can tell, hey, I have taken right now. There are some instrument where you can on the spot you can do, but again. Uh, uh, they take some kind of theoretical calculations and everything, and calibration is a real challenge in the field. So, where are you? Where, what is your idea of using? Where do you plan to use that, and how deep it can go? Its core. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a two-inch sodium iodide detector for the instrument on the right. And so it's just going to be nothing different than any other two-inch sodium iodide detector from a from a detection sensitivity standpoint. Um, so that's that's the the limitation I would think. But but I I, I think you know my my thought would be and and maybe there's other experts that can correct me. But I would think that if you're trying to do that type of decontamination, you probably want a full like 1024 spectrum analyzer where you can actually look at all the different radionuclides that are in the, the sample that you're pulling. Is that true? That, that is true. In fact, uh, I've done a number of these types of studies in Oak Ridge and uh, we'd use even 32 channel high purity germanium detector for some of that sure. work. Yeah. yeah, because the sodium iodide yeah. would be kind of a poor resolution. Yeah. You wouldn't have yeah. really good resolution with right. sodium iodide. I think the yeah. question is good. It, it was never purposed for this, although it, right. it has the 1024 channels, but it's it's still sodium iodide, so you're only getting about 6 7% resolution. All right. Thanks a lot. Sure. Because thanks we, for the question. Uh, Warnick has a question. Warnick? Perhaps Warnick would like me to read it. So I will. For food or radiation, how does the signal you measure decay with time? That is, how permanent is the induced charge in uh, in the food? Sure. So depending on the material, it's nothing more uh, or less than a typical TL or OSL material, where it could have a fade characteristic. The the biggest. So so what we've experienced, the biggest uh, contributor to loss of signal is light. 
And so what happens is people will get the samples of material and don't realize that they have to keep it in a dark room or a dark bag or transport it in dark you know, in a dark environment. And what they're doing is they're basically optically bleaching the material before it even gets to the instrument. So that tends to be the biggest issue. But, but to the real question, yeah, they're, they're, depending on the material's uh, origin, there can be def, a, 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 a fade contribution, you know, based on just elevated temperature, for example, where the, the signal does, does deteriorate over time. But again, it's, that tends to be less uh, because we're talking about kilograms uh, of dose uh, of the original material, light tends to be its the bigger culprit compared to heat. Uh, but but heat can affect it. But but we're looking also for a go no go. It's not like we're looking for parts of dose where we're looking for exactly how much dose was provided. We're looking was it irradiated or wasn't it irradiated. That's that's the only thing we're we're trying to understand. Okay, great. Thank you. And then uh, Gordon Cleveland has a question. I'll go ahead and read. He may not be mic'd either. What archaeological app? Oh, go ahead, Gordon. Go ahead. No, go ahead. That's great. Just okay. What archaeological? I can't pronounce the word anyway. <laughs> well, I was going to have a hard time with it as well. <laughs> Does the uh, spectrofluorimetry system analyze potassium, argon, carbon fourteen, etc.? So what it's it's looking for it's it's taking whatever the material that's let's just say on the painting and getting a spectra from it and so from that spectra it's not a, it's not a um, it's not a ionizing radiation spectra it's more of a luminescence spectra and so what it, from that from that you can see it's um, I'm trying to think there's an ins, there's instruments other types of laboratory instruments that do similar things. Uh, bench type instruments where they're 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 still doing spectrum analysis but it's just on the light signal so it's it's not in the ionizing part of the uh, energy range it's it's much more in the I'll call it visible light or between uh, ultraviolet and um, um, infrared all right thank you sure so I see no other questions in the chat uh, anything else from anybody else? Jeff, this is Jeff, John Gill. Dan, Apologies. We a, oh, we've got uh, John and Dan on at the same time. Go ahead, John. Um, I was going to ask my apologies. I was just a tad late, but I was curious, uh, is it using avalanche diode uh, as opposed to PMT or a combination of both? I missed the beginning part of the question. I heard uh, avalanche photodiodes. What was the beginning part? Um, my apologies, I, I missed the very beginning. I may have, this may have been covered, but was it uh, avalanche diode based um, or uh, just uh, PMT or combination? Uh, in which uh, which unit? Um, I guess both. Oh, so do you mean in the uh, the Gantt, the core loggers? Oh, they're PMT based. Yeah, they're 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 very much standard run of the mill PMTs, uh, standard 1024 uh, spectrum analyzer, uh, two inch uh, sodium iodide on the handheld, and a four inch uh, sodium iodide on the uh, on the roll uh, rolling one. We've actually experimented with BGO and some of the other scintillators. Um, so so. B BGO has been kind of an interesting um, uh, uh, detector, but part of the problem is we're dealing with quite a wide uh, temperature range, and so compensation for BGO, for at least for us, becomes more complicated, whereas sodium iodide is a pretty straightforward temperature co correction curve. Um, so that's why we stayed with sodium iodide, and I'd, I'd have to say probably the, the researchers that put this together are much more comfortable with it. To, to your question, though, I do think that you could probably take a lot of space and weight out of it with some of the newer technologies, um, but it just, just hasn't gotten there. And, and there is, you know, there, there it used to be when, when oil was, when we were paying $4 at the pump, um, it, there wasn't as much price sensitivity, and now there's a lot of price sensitivity just because of the way oil has gone. And... Um, so, you know, investing anything into um, a more expensive detector and or technology um, just hasn't been considered at this point. It's just it, it does what they want and so be it. But but it's it's something that definitely could be used as a, a replacement. Makes sense. Thank you. I think Dan, Dan was up. 
Oh, I was just going to wrap up and ask if we had a uh, date set for next week or were we uh, uh, skipping and going to the following week? We are waiting uh, for confirmation from ATL uh, for okay. the date. It'll be the same time, noon. Yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. And uh, it may be the following week. Uh, this is Bob. It, it may not even be oh. next week. It may be the following oh, okay. week. Okay. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Joe. Really sure, appreciate it. Thank you it. very much. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye -bye. Enjoy.